Our next, um, our next speaker, uh, Andrew Klekachuk, Dr. Andrew Klekachuk, um, grew up in Tassie, studied at UTAS, um, where he gained his PhD in physics in 1991 uh, with a thesis in radio astronomy. So, fantastic. Um, 1987 joined the AAD uh, and as a wintering physicist at Macquarie Island for the 40, 41st ANEA expedition. Um, while working at the AAD, Andrew's interests in, have evolved from studying of pulsating auroras to investigating the mesosphere, the stratosphere with LIDAR, and more recently to the role played by clouds in the climate of the Southern Ocean and how the Antarctic ozone hole influences climate. So Andrew currently leads the atmosphere and ice sheet section at the AAD's uh, Antarctic Climate Program. And uh, that's what Andrew's talk is all about. So welcome, Andrew. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Justin. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here and uh, amongst uh, fellows uh, of all sorts here that uh, have a lot of interest in things that I'm interested in. Um, I started out um, listening to shortwave radio in my backyard and evolved into, uh, into climate studies in the Antarctic. And uh, a few folks here, um, Rex, Kim, uh, Petty Yates, and probably a few folks online, uh, Warren down at Casey, and uh, Alan Jeffrey, if he's around, uh, helped us with a lot of the stuff that uh, we ended up doing at the Antarctic Division in the climate uh, space. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a, a tour of uh, what we've been doing uh, in the Antarctic, a little bit about what's happening at the moment, and I'll throw in a little bit of history along the way. So uh, in this first slide here is actually uh, shows you a few of the instruments that we uh, use in the Antarctic. We've got a laboratory at Davis Station that actually uh, uh, evolved actually through uh, years that Rex was involved in the program and helped steer um, the work we do. Uh, a LIDAR observatory we, we established thanks to, to Rex, actually a demonstration of some of the uh, modular capability in, in buildings uh, in the 90s and uh, helped get uh, some of the local companies actually interested in uh, building uh, relocatable structures uh, for the Antarctic. And we operated uh, a LIDAR um, that ran for a number of years and has evolved. Uh, and also, um, we established a number of instruments that continue on today, showing there our VHF radar, uh, 55 megahertz radar down at uh, Davis. Anyway, we'll come to it to talk about a few of those things and some of the phenomena that we uh, investigated. So I'm going to uh, give my talk really in two parts. Uh, say a little bit about uh, what we have been doing, where we came from, and. Uh, go right back to uh, the start of uh, atmospheric physics, really, uh, in the modern era, and say a bit about how the program has evolved, but also go on to talk a bit about some of the research that we're doing at the moment. So Rex has sort of given you uh, quite a bit of background here, but uh, of course now the Antarctic Division uh, is operating under the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment. Uh, we have a budget of about 100 million and we were talking during the break, a lot of that money actually goes to just being in the Antarctic. Uh, it's expensive to get there uh, and to survive the winter uh, provisioning the stations uh, is quite expensive. About 300 full-time staff in Antarctica uh, in any year, uh, typically we have sort of around about 80 to 90 or so wintering expeditions at the four stations and that swells over the summer. Uh, but we have uh, quite a, a program now. We have um, uh, quite an extensive science program, which is about a quarter of the budget. Uh, again, we were talking during the break, Rex had actually helped bring up the, uh, the fraction of the budget spent in science uh, during his time, and that's, that's grown even further. You can see there our new icebreaker, Noina, which has been in Hobart uh, recently, and that's really the centrepiece of a lot of the work that we're involved in at the moment. Uh, fantastic capability for marine science, atmospheric science, oceanography, biological sciences. And um, that's really bringing about a, a quantum leap now in some of the work that we can do. Uh, I mentioned those four permanent stations. Uh, we've seen them on the map 
that Rex had, Mawson, Davis, Casey, Macquarie Island, and we still intend to keep those operating uh, into the future. And uh, now with our new intercontinental uh, and intracontinental air transport capability, plus the ship will be uh, venturing further into the Antarctic, uh, trying to get uh, over as much of the, uh, the continent as possible, I think, for various reasons. Antarctic Science Program has evolved. Um, I guess the, the real change really happened during Rex's years, and we did refocus the program onto uh, core areas. And one of those was, as Rex showed, understanding the role of Antarctica in the global climate system. Um, the program that we run is um, developed through a, a process which involves a strategic plan. So we have an agreed set of priorities. It's administered by the Australian Antarctic Science Council. And in fact, uh, we have a new plan uh, which was launched by the minister about a year ago. And its mission really is to conduct world-class science in the Antarctic that's of benefit to Australia, but also the broader international community. So we really are focused in on things that are important uh, for our future and not just using Antarctica as a a place to undertake esoteric research. Um, I guess some of the work that started off in the Antarctic program uh, way back um, when uh, the Antarctic Division was established in the 1950s was really using Antarctica as a platform to uh, conduct various scientific studies, but now we're really focused in on making a difference. You can see the three themes that we currently have, a little bit different to uh, Rex's uh, slide there, but environmental protection and management really is key. Antarctic is such a, a wonderful but fragile place. Um, it's very easy to disturb and damage the small fraction that's actually exposed uh, uh, the rocky areas, uh, less than 0.5% of Antarctica is, you know, really ice free. Um, and there are a number of fragile ecosystems uh, that operate in the Antarctic. Now we uh, you know, conduct research over the wide range of physical domains, really linking the atmosphere, ocean and ice together. And that's really important to understand where the climate's going. Rex mentioned the buffering ability of the Southern Ocean. That's really a fundamental importance, but now sea level rise, um, changing acidification of the ocean uh, pose global threats and we really need to understand where that's happening. And the third activity there is the human presence, understanding how we're changing the environment. Uh, simple things like wastewater treatment, um, the antibiotics that uh, we use um, going into the system, how are we changing uh, the, the local environments and what signals can we see of change outside of Antarctica, um, pesticides, for example? Um, I mentioned the Noina, which is that really fundamental change now. Um, it's currently off in dry dock in Singapore, if you're wondering where it is. <laughs> um, but when it comes back, it will do uh, its first proper resupply of Davis Station, and then it will uh, conduct a number of uh, scientific trials, and one of those will actually involve establishing a new atmospheric capability on the ship. I'm being part of that. Um, we're using the ship actually now to really probe the chemical makeup of the atmosphere over the Southern Ocean, um, understanding clouds and radiation over the Southern Ocean and how they're altering the radiation balance, as I'll come to shortly. We're also modernising the Antarctic program again. Uh, we're always rebuilding. Um, We've got reason to, to keep going there. Um, the stations, you know, have been established, the, the modern stations, we've got over 30 years on some of the facilities there, and there's a need for renewal and making things simpler. Technology is advancing. We need to be environmentally more friendly and use renewables where we can. So that's a, a big part. The science is augmented by some other activities. In this building, we have activities in the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership. So upstairs, um, University of Tasmania, AAD, CSIRO, Bureau of Meteorology, um, Geoscience Australia, 
uh, amongst others, uh, working on uh, key aspects of uh, environmental studies in the Antarctic. Uh, we have a, an activity in there looking at um, the Southern Ocean um, clouds and radiation there. So that's $50 million over roughly uh, sort of 10 years um, there, or it's actually a little bit less. Um, also the Special Research Initiative, um, which is uh, university-based um, at, uh, at, um, at uh, UTAS, but also at, uh, at Monash Uni, um, conducting other, other programs. So there's been some augmentation of the science budget. So just stepping back a little bit uh, to where uh, I've been involved over the last 35 or so years, um, the atmospheric research has always been a fundamental part of, uh, of Antarctic studies, even way back into the early uh, heroic era. Um, there's always been an interest in the atmosphere and its special phenomena, um, understanding how Antarctica regulates the global climate. Uh, in the early days of the Antarctic program, uh, under Phil Law, we established our, our four stations, and they're actually selected to some extent, uh, well, based on um, rocky areas, of course, but it provided a, an important way of probing the upper atmosphere. Actually, the stations are conveniently located at different geomagnetic latitudes and have enabled us to study a number of phenomena um, there. So you can sort of see that in the picture uh, on the right hand side there showing um, uh, magnetic latitude circles around the stations. But uh, the work that we're doing at the moment is really trying to understand the basic state of the atmosphere and how it's changing. And I've listed a, a few characteristics there. And quite heavily involved now in improving global climate and weather models. Um, there are some key features of the Antarctic that are very important to include in those models. Um, there's still some activity in space weather. Um, Rex mentioned the upper atmosphere program. And yes, we did study things like auroras and um, geomagnetic storms and interactions between the solar wind and, and the Earth. That's now covered by the Bureau of Meteorology under their space weather uh, services activity. And we still operate, uh, well, they still operate equipment in the Antarctic, which goes way back. But stepping right back to the early days, there's an interesting link um, between Tasmania and uh, atmospheric research in the early days, which I discovered when I first went to, Macri uh, to uh, Mariah Island, actually. Um, Louis Bernacchi, uh, perhaps the first physicist really in the Antarctic, uh, an atmospheric physicist or a magnetic observer. Um, he had a number of roles. Um, he was born actually in Belgium and his parents uh, moved out to Tasmania and actually took up residence at Darlington on Royal Island. And uh, Bernacki was educated here in Hobart uh, at Hutchins School, I think, and uh, ended up uh, getting an interest in natural phenomena and became uh, a magnetic observer in Melbourne and was selected for uh, the first wintering uh, expedition, um, the Southern Cross expedition, which uh, Elliot mentioned there. And um, he was actually part of the wintering team at Cape Adair, which is shown uh, down on the map there at, at lower right. Um, so he was selected by Karsten uh, Bushdevnik and uh, went there and made measurements of um, the meteorology, but also of the magnetism, of course, being an uh, interesting site. They're not that far away from the South Magnetic Pole. Um, quite successful in that work, and then became part of Scott's uh, discovery expedition and actually wintered uh, at Winter Quarters Bay, uh, which is in the McMurdo Sound region, where he actually did some cosmic, really cosmic ray physics. So he's shown there um, training on electrometer, which actually helped him make measurements of the atmospheric electric field, which are influenced by cosmic rays. So he's kind of one of the first cosmic ray physicists. But I thought that was an interesting link um, and of course, a lot of the work we do today kind of still relates to some of that. Cosmic ray physics is still part of uh, the Bureau of Space Weather Program. And of course, we are very interested in the meteorology of the Antarctic. But it was quite a while actually after that, um, 
number of uh, studies were, were done, of course, in the Antarctic on weather, but really the, the modern era of uh, the Australian uh, physics studies really started uh, with the establishment of ANARI. And um, uh, I'm showing here just a few of the uh, interesting uh, photos from the archives of some of the, uh, the early gear, which uh, I guess uh, it certainly looks like Cold War uh, era <laughs> equipment there in a number of ways. But the fundamental things that were, were studied in the earlier days, the cosmic ray flux, uh, little was known about how cosmic rays interacted with uh, the Earth. And of course, there was a lot of interest in the establishment of the space program as to the radiation field and um, how the Earth actually behaved um, as, a, as a large geomagnet. And that provided opportunities for a number of studies and uh, helped us really establish a program focused a lot at, at Mawson Station where uh, at high magnetic latitude there were some favourable conditions for looking at auroras and studying some of the, the basic physics around that. A lot of that work actually continued on through the 60s and 70s and even into the 80s. And some of that gear actually uh, it still keeps going in various ways. I'm just showing here a, a few of the old, uh, the old things which, have, uh, which are still operating in the Antarctic. Um, the work at Mawson really was fundamental in, in establishing Mawson as an important cosmic ray uh, facility. And uh, we actually established the first underground cosmic ray observatory in the Antarctica, and that still operates today. Um, the rock shields uh, the detectors from a lot of the low energy cosmic rays and we can actually see some uh, fundamental um, processes and actually monitoring uh, the behaviour of the sun in the long term. Um, magnetic measurements on the, the right hand side, they're pretty, pretty important, understanding the, the variations in the geomagnetic field and how the Earth's field is actually changing and weakening. Um, that's an important part of still some of the work at uh, at Casey and I was talking to Warren down there recently and apparently he's still involved in some of the magnetic absolute measurements that continue on. Things like rheometers, um, that's a uh, 30 megahertz uh, receiver which uh, measures galactic radio noise but it's uh, an important way of looking at uh, absorption due to high energy protons coming into the atmosphere and we actually have rheometers at all the stations still and that's part of the Bureau's um, monitoring uh, under the ICAO arrangements for um, aircraft systems. Uh, HF is still used by aircraft at high latitudes, apparently, and um, it's still important to know when there are radio blackouts. So uh, I was down at Macquarie Island not that many years ago, and that uh, realm is still operating. You can actually see the data from that on the Bureau of Space Weather site. We established a number of other instruments in the 90s. Um, uh, a digital ionosonde at Davis, um, which we ran, well, we still run actually, but uh, the Bureau has now got the operation of that, um, looking at um, the basic state of the ionosphere, but that particular instrument gives us a lot of information on the plasma in the upper atmosphere. And other instruments there, uh, a meteor radar and an imaging rheometer as well at Davis. So these things still continue and provide scientific outputs, but our program is uh, not particularly involved in any of the research from those instruments at the moment. What we do, though, uh, is we still operate our observatory at Davis Station where we have a number of instruments that probe quite a depth of the atmosphere, and I'm showing uh, on the left-hand side there the coverage by our instruments. Um, I mentioned the LIDAR that we operated um, through the, uh, the 2000s. That was middle atmosphere system which probed heights from near the ground to about 110 kilometres. We don't operate that anymore, but we've replaced that now with a system that um, gives us information on clouds and aerosols in the lower atmosphere. Uh, we've moved on from some fairly complicated equipment to instruments that are much lighter weight and more reliable uh, and use uh, less consumables and require less maintenance, and that's been um, a benefit um, to the program, actually, a lot of the technological developments. So, you know, we started off with uh, computers that were uh, large and bulky in the early days. We had the old PDP computers, and now we've uh, graduated down to NUCs and the like. So we operate a lot of equipment now with very small, lightweight systems. Um, 
So just showing you on the right hand side there, the structure of the atmosphere in the Antarctic, that the, there are some special um, characteristics of it. Um, in the summertime, the upper atmosphere is actually the coldest place on Earth. Uh, temperatures get down to minus 150 degrees uh, Celsius or thereabouts. And in the, uh, in the 90s and 2000s, we took advantage of that to study some uh, phenomena that are only occurring in the high latitudes in summer, the so-called polar mesospheric clouds. And we use these as indicators of change in the upper atmosphere. They, they're a bit like a, a miner's canary, if you like, on the temperature and water vapour in the upper atmosphere. And we've made it, uh, measurements uh, of those over a number of years, which show trends, um, as seen in other parts of the globe. So that's been an important part. And we've seen um, or measured those clouds with our, our radars and lidars. In the, uh, the winter, um, Antarctic, the Antarctic atmosphere becomes isolated from the rest of the globe and becomes very cold. And that causes uh, another type of cloud to form the polar stratospheric clouds, which are part of of ozone depletion. So our program has been also involved in uh, analysing and looking at that phenomenon. But the instruments we still operate today include, um, as you can see, uh, radars, uh, which probe in blue there, the lower part of the atmosphere, a VHF radar, 55 megahertz radar at Davis, which is part of uh, the global um, wind profiling network. And uh, we still measure uh, winds in the upper atmosphere there with um, a medium frequency, two megahertz radar, and also meteor radars as well. So still monitoring a number of, of key areas there. Here are some of the instruments again. Uh, we've seen the uh, laboratory there. Um, one of the key aspects of that laboratory is it has a number of observation ports on the roof, which enable us to, uh, to look out with uh, spectrometers. Uh, we have a, a North Sky camera there and in the future, there'll be ability to host much uh, greater number of instruments in, in that lab. We have a, an engineer that uh, winters over that maintains the observatory. I'll talk a little bit about some of the, uh, the other instruments as we go along. So here's a map of uh, Davis showing the, the real estate we occupy, which is actually a, a fair um, swathe of uh, the station. Um, the lab itself is relatively compact, but we have uh, uh, the radar arrays. You can see um, on the right-hand side there, VHF radar, um, the medium frequency radar as well, um, and various other instruments uh, near a magnetic quiet zone, which is still um, maintained to uh, allow us to make magnetic measurements into the future. But uh, a number of instruments scattered around Davis Station. Uh, I guess there's uh, some interest recently in the ability or the, the potential of uh, creating a rock runway at Davis. That project's now been cancelled, but that would have actually uh, established uh, an extensive runway uh, near Davis Station and um, also brought about a large change in the station itself, a rebuilding of the station, uh, and that potentially would have relocated a number of our instruments. But for the foreseeable future, at least anyway, um, the station will keep operating as it is. So the main areas that we now work on, so we moved from uh, the upper atmosphere studies um, of the early part of the Anari. Um, Justin mentioned I started out looking at uh, pulsating auroras. Um, the change that happened in the mid-90s um, focused us on to climate change related work. So we now have three parts of our program, Southern Ocean clouds, uh, middle atmosphere dynamics and ozone. We still need to understand the um, future of the ozone layer, but also how the atmospheric circulation is evolving under climate change. And we also have uh, still activities that relate to long-term monitoring. So we do that with a small group uh, at the Antarctic Division uh, I mentioned our wintering engineer, but we also have uh, some other research staff shared between the AAPP and uh, CSIRO as well now, and training students 
which is an important part of um, maintaining uh, the scientific outputs. So I'll just mention now a few points about some of the key areas that we're working on. So I mentioned Southern Ocean clouds. What's the uh, problem? Um, aren't clouds well understood? Well, it turns out not in the Southern Hemisphere. And the plot on the right-hand side there shows um, the biases that are occurring in the global climate models when they model the amount of radiation from the sun uh, getting through the Earth system. Basically, the models are creating a southern ocean that's too warm by actually around about a degree or two. Um, those biases are shown in the number of watts per square metre that the models are overestimating. So basically, the cloud field in these models uh, is allowing too much radiation to the Southern Ocean. You can imagine if you're trying to model sea ice around Antarctica, a degree or two actually could be quite important given that there's a you know, particular threshold for sea ice formation around about minus you know, 2.4 degrees uh, in, the, in the ocean. So this is a big deal still. And a lot of work's happened around the world trying to address this. It really comes down to a difference between Southern Ocean clouds and clouds uh, around the rest of the globe, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere mid latitudes. And part of that reason is some of the different processes that are occurring in the Southern Ocean. Um, we know that there's less population, uh, of course, in the Southern Hemisphere and there's less pollution in general. And that, that's part of the story. Um, the clouds in the Southern Ocean are actually um, slightly different in their ability to remain liquid. And they can remain liquid at lower temperatures than they can in the Northern Hemisphere. And the upshot of that is basically when you try and follow photons um, through the system, those liquid clouds actually make the difference. And so we're trying to demonstrate that with the measurements that we're making um, through field programs, but also the modelling. So um, we're making some good progress on that. And I think over the next sort of five years or so, we'll actually see this problem um, re largely resolved in climate models, and that will give us the a bit better ability to actually um, predict changes in, in sea ice, but also of the temperature of the Southern Ocean. Um, Rex mentioned that global conveyor belt. It's important to get that sea ice right, because that's really the thing that triggers off the uh, ocean circulation. So in our climate models, if we can get that right, it really helps to fix a number of other issues. Um, some of the measurements we've been making um, include measurements on the Aurora Australis. We've had instruments going backwards and forwards um, between Hobart and the stations. We had a field campaign on Macquarie Island where we had the US Department of Energy uh, contribute a number of instruments there and also on the Aurora Australis. And we're currently mining through the vast amount of data that we've collected also on aircraft. Uh, there was an aircraft program flown out of Hobart a couple of years back that uh, got in situ measurements uh, on the clouds themselves. So that's really starting to pay some dividends there. Um, some of the things that we've been able to do actually, um, really for the first time, um, probe clouds from below. There are a number of satellite mission, missions that are looking at clouds from above. Um, but really, some of the clouds over the Southern Ocean, as anybody who's been on a ship will know, are pretty dense. It, uh, it's often pretty misty and, and rainy underneath. And um, so some of the work that we've been doing with LIDARs and radars, and we're showing a sort of a combination of things there, we can actually fingerprint the types of cloud based on their physical characteristics and their temperature. So in the top picture there, we're actually able to classify clouds into liquid and ice layers, and that's pretty important in trying to evaluate uh, where models are going wrong. We're also using machine learning techniques with uh, cloud images to uh, measure fundamental things like just the cloud fraction, how much of the Southern Ocean is cloudy. And it turns out that um, uh, the models themselves also underpredict the amount of cloud in the Southern Ocean, and that's another factor why there's too much radiation getting into the, into the um, into the surface in the models. And so just making even fundamental measurements about the cloudiness um, 
and doing that in a way which um, is not subjective. It doesn't, you know, rely on the human ability to determine, you know, a cloud fraction, but uses actual machine learning um, with cloud imagery. Um, we've been able to do some of that. Uh, and at the moment, actually, at Davis, we have a, uh, a set of uh, instruments, very similar to the one on the upper left-hand side there, um, a uh, number of things looking at basic radiation, precipitation and the structure of clouds as part of a, a campaign year of polar prediction, which is trying to understand um, atmospheric rivers and how moisture is transported between mid-latitudes and the Antarctic. So atmospheric rivers are coming into the vernacular of late. Um, the floods in the East Coast, um, uh, in particular, actually, a good example of an atmospheric river, a lot of the moisture in the Pacific at the moment, uh, finding its way to Australia. And then, of course, if anybody was following the news in March, a heat wave, um, unprecedented temperatures uh, on the Antarctic continent. Uh, moisture was re um, related to that atmospheric river, um, actually bringing rain to parts of the uh, East Antarctic continent. And so uh, we've got some instruments there, fairly small footprint that um, measure precipitation and profile it through clouds. Um, LIDARs and radars are all part of that. And uh, in the bottom um, left there, uh, that's a second generation LIDAR system we developed um, to actually measure the presence of, of ice and liquid layers. And that's shown in the uh, image on the right hand side there. We can actually uh, differentiate um, in the bottom panel there, the, the, uh, the red areas there are icy layers. Um, and if you look, um, uh, some of the bright backscatter is actually um, weakly depolarizing, and that's because it's liquid. So you can actually have liquid clouds, uh, even in the Antarctic, at temperatures down to about minus 30 degrees. Quite counterintuitive, but it's the low pressure that really allows that vapor to exist. So. Um, using some of our skill that we developed through the program in the 90s to actually um, make some uh, important measurements on cloud properties. Another area that uh, we have focused in on is addressing some other biases in climate models. Um, you may not know, but um, if you uh, look at the state-of-the-art climate models, they still have some biases in temperature um, high up in the atmosphere, in the stratosphere, and that's shown in that image um, on the left-hand side there, of up to 10 degrees in certain areas, particularly in the middle um, or lower part of the stratosphere. Um, surprising given that uh, we've had uh, decades now of development of, of climate models, they still have these large biases, I'm actually showing there um, the red and the blue uh, in Australian version of the global climate model compared with all the others. It's actually fairly similar. But this is important because um, the chemistry of ozone depletion critically depends on temperature. Um, those stratospheric clouds I mentioned have a threshold and it's getting the temperature right in the atmosphere that's important for that threshold. Um, those clouds uh, enable the conversion of the chlorofluorocarbon um, gases that were developed for refrigeration, or at least um, the um, byproducts of those, they're broken down by UV light in the atmosphere. Um, those chlorofluorocarbon molecules bind to those stratospheric clouds and release chlorine, which then goes on to destroy ozone. So it's actually getting that whole process right that's pretty important. And that leads into the, the right-hand side image there, being involved in uh, modelling to project the future development of the ozone hole. And you can see their um, projections and uh, from the climate models in blue for global ozone and Antarctic ozone. So we're currently 2020 in the recovery phase of ozone depletion and actually fairly, fairly much on track. But I guess one of the things that's still um, uh, happening is that we do need to tweak our models to, to account for that temperature bias. And also we're not capturing a lot of the interannual variability in um, the ozone hole. If you've been following the ozone hole 
in the last few years. Um, last year and the year before, very large ozone holes. Uh, 2019, uh, unusually small, and that was the year, of course, we had the wildfires in East Australia and the behaviour of the stratosphere in Antarctica actually had an influence on the dry conditions that we had in that year. So there are a number of things now we're understanding the links between ozone depletion and the state of the Antarctic stratosphere are important for uh, even the Australian continent. Uh, our, one of the radars I mentioned, the, um, the VHF, the 55 megahertz radar at Davis, is part of the global uh, wind profiling network. It's the only Antarctic radar and the data from our radar goes into the global telecommunications system and is picked up by a number of modelling centres uh, in Europe, uh, the US, but also Australia. And so actually the forecast that um, the Bureau is generating uh, has been for the last year or so um, is using our, our data to actually um, validate and improve the wind field uh, in the Antarctic. Now the Bureau still operates radio songs twice a day uh, at the stations, but um, our radar gives you know, continuous coverage and so uh, models now are being initialised um, more frequently than once a day and that uh, really helps um, if we've got uh, data that's quite fresh and so um, our radar goes into that. Uh, in the left hand side there, that's um, essentially a signal to noise um, plot of the radar backscatter. So the, the mechanism here um, is that the radar waves are reflecting off moisture in the atmosphere. So we actually need moisture to um, provide a mechanism to scatter back that 55 megahertz signal. And you can see there, that's actually a, a plot from yesterday um, for Davis showing a, a fairly dry region uh, in the upper troposphere. And, um, and then the tropopause is above that. But this is giving us some really important insights now into uh, the moisture profile in the atmosphere. And with our system, it's a Doppler LIDAR. So we're um, scattering um, off the atmosphere from some cardinal point directions and, and getting a vector wind as well. So we actually build up a 3D um, vector wind over the station. That work also enables us to look at small scale motions in the atmosphere, which, which are quite important in um, some of the unresolved aspects of climate models. A lot of climate models, just for computational efficiency, actually have to parameterize a number of things. They have to use equations to represent the small scale. And um, our radar provides some insights into some of those small scale phenomena. Something that actually we established um, uh, in Rex's time um, and even slightly before uh, were measurements of um, air glow from the very top of the atmosphere. The hydroxyl uh, molecule actually radiates in the near infrared. And by measuring the intensity of those emissions at different wavelengths in the near infrared, we can actually get a measure of the local temperature at about 87 kilometres. We've got one of the longest records um, dating back actually to um, the 19... 80s, the late 1980s. Um, some of those measurements are shown in the upper right hand side there. Um, that instrument still continues. Um, that second panel shows the uncertainty in those measurements. We get a measure of the nightly mean temperature on the order of um, uh, about one Kelvin. Um, and we've improved the, um, the accuracy of that over the years. And when we start to look at um, the variability of that, we remove the, the climatology, we actually start to see some interesting uh, phenomena. We see the influence of the solar cycle, that's 10.7 centimetre flux shown at the bottom there. And you can see a small modulation of temperatures. And when we delve into this a little bit uh, more fully, so what we've done in the top uh, plot there, that's essentially showing the the annual average uh, temperature over the winter um, from each of the years where we've removed um, the, um, uh, well, the climate, the climatology, essentially. Um, seeing variability there, part of that's due to the solar cycle, as I mentioned, and that middle panel is actually the 
correlation between the 10.7 centimetre flux and those residual measurements. You can actually see it's only a very small variation from year to year that we're seeing at Davis. But when you remove the solar cycle contribution, you see uh, two, two key things. First is the cooling of the upper atmosphere. Um, this is the signature of um, global climate change. Carbon dioxide, um, we all know in the lower atmosphere, which is actually a warming agent, but in the upper atmosphere, um, the fact that the, uh, the molecules um, of carbon dioxide are fairly far apart allows radiation to escape back into space and it actually enhances the ability of the Earth to lose heat um, out to space. And so the upper atmosphere is cooling and it's cooling at about 10 times the warming rate of the lower atmosphere. And it provides an important way of actually testing um, the modelling of carbon dioxide levels. Carbon dioxide is quite well mixed in the atmosphere, so the concentrations we see, um, the relative concentrations at the surface actually are reflected in the upper atmosphere. So the fact that it's changing 10 times as fast as the surface actually provides quite a nice signal. Uh, we don't have to wait centuries to see the effects of climate change. We only need a few decades, and so we're seeing that now. So that's that cooling rate there. Um, it's about... 0.1 degrees per annum or about one degree per decade. And then over the top of that is a cycle, around about four year cycle. Uh, this quasi, what we call the quasi quadrennial oscillation. So that's the, um, uh, the variation in those data points there with a, um, a sinusoid over the top and some satellite measurements comparing. Um, this is actually a new phenomenon which shows links between the surface climate and the upper atmosphere on a four-year cycle. And the intriguing thing is that the climate models we've looked at uh, don't show the signature, and it's actually a global signature and seen now by others in their instrumentation. But the important thing for us is that being able to continue measurements over the long term has really enabled us to see all of that. We wouldn't have been able to do that if we just had a few years of measurements. So that's a few of the things that uh, we've been doing in the Antarctic, and I just have a few uh, summary points. Um, I guess one of the things that uh, I sort of alluded to at the end there is really those long-term measurements are, are key. Uh, and, you know, government is good at keeping things going for long-term, um, longer than, you know, the political cycle. <laughs> and we've been quite lucky, really, to keep instruments in the Antarctic. It's actually quite difficult to establish stuff in the Antarctic, and so you... When you get it down there, you really want it to, to stay and last, so we've been able to do that. Um, one of the other things I guess we've had, you know, uh, to adapt to is, is changing directions in the Antarctic program. I think we successfully navigated uh, the change that um, Rex and others brought in, and for very good reason. Um, we did need to focus more on things that were important to the nation. Um, and now with our climate modelling, that's you know, quite a, a key thing. Uh, the ability to actually have uh, good weather prediction, obviously, is very important for anybody planning a wedding um, or, um, you know, um, going to the football, but it's beyond that, obviously. If you want to understand sea level rise, um, changes in ocean circulation, how it's going to affect food webs, you really do need very accurate or well-informed climate models. And so... That's our key focus, and that's that's where we've been able to adapt um, and bring in the science that we established and learned from that. We've kept up with technology too. Um, obviously, things have, have changed over the years. We had a very powerful laser. That was cutting edge, quite complex to operate, and now we're reaping the benefits from some of the developments there with lightweight uh, diode pump lasers and, and the like. Um, our radar technology, we've been improving that, and recently we've actually upgraded the transmitter uh, to a fully digital transmitter on the uh, VHF radar. Um, that wasn't available at the time when we uh, put the system together. But overarching everything there really is, is collaboration. We can't do any of this in isolation. Some of the things we're tackling are, are much bigger than individual research interests, and, and that's where um, Hobart's really been um, a key centre, the establishment of things like in the early days, um, IASOS, the Institute of Antarctic and Southern Ocean Studies, then later the uh, 
Cooperative Research Centre uh, and the Antarctic Climate Ecosystems Cooperative Research Centre. And now with the, the other developments that are happening, it's really enabled a lot of activity to, to take off. So uh, with that, thank you very much for your attention. Um, Andrew, uh, have you seen, um, everybody talks about the effects of the COVID years <laughs> where everyone's not driving around in cars and whatever else. Have you actually seen in, in the, the, the things that are being recorded a, a change in those years? No, that's an interesting point. Um, you might expect, say, carbon dioxide levels, for example, uh, to have changed, but um, there's no there's no evidence of any um, significant changes in the southern hemisphere um, in carbon dioxide. Um, very small uh, in comparison to some of the seasonal cycles, uh, my understanding, but we don't expect to see any of these effects even in the upper atmosphere, for example. Um, so. Uh, despite the fact that yeah, there's been a lot of economic disruption, um, it's still really minuscule in comparison to a lot of the other global activity. And also a lot of the, um, uh, the, the human fingerprint that's already trapped in the system and you know emerges even with changes in ocean temperature, for example. So um, as an example, the, the temperature of the Southern Ocean is, is quite key to how much carbon it takes up. Um, as it's warming, it's actually taking up less carbon. And so a blip like COVID um, turns out to be quite negligible in, in comparison to those at the outgassing of the Southern Ocean. Okay. No questions online? Could I just ask a, um, a question around um, a less technical question, but I noticed in your earlier slides, all the instruments you had on um, Macquarie Island all had fences around them. Is there <laughs> wildlife on Macquarie Island that attacks these things? Yes, uh, elephant seals, um, you know, are the key the key destroyers of anything really. Um, they they have no uh, no social skills really in, in avoiding things. And in fact, um, uh, Rex mentioned the um, OTC development. I was part of the uh, construction team on the, the Inari Sat system at Macquarie Island uh, in that first year where we established the, uh, the satellite link and we actually had elephant seals coming through as we were pouring cement and actually landing in the cement. Um, and so doing environmental uh, reporting on uh, the effects of cement on elephant seals was actually part of our work and trying to hose them down. It was uh, quite chaotic and actually uh, I think in the end we ran out of concrete. I think um, uh, that was a problem. We actually had to, uh, and part of that was because the elephant seals were, were getting in and sloshing it out of the the, uh, the enclosure there. But yes, everything has to be elephant seal proof, the rheometers and other instruments, but even those um, treated pine logs aren't often sufficient if an elephant seal, a bull sits up on them. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of maintenance that happens on those enclosures. Andrew, you showed a number of pictures there of the um, LIDAR module at, at Davis, and that had a, a big sliding roof on top of it to expose the um, receiving um, mirror arrangement. Mm. Do you still use that sliding roof for, for since you, you don't have that LIDAR anymore, do you, you still need that sliding roof? No, unfortunately, we haven't um, done anything with that building. So we, we ran the LIDAR from 2001 to 2012, <laughs> and actually Peter was part of the group that put the instrument together and a lot of the, the electronics development. Um, we're looking at repurposing the lab and um, uh, we did actually have the aim of putting a, a scanning LIDAR in which we um, basically cut short that idea. Um, again, it's just difficult getting people into the Antarctic and we ended up um, running a, a vertical system again in our main lab. But it would be nice to use that. Um, uh, one of the local companies, um, which was at the time Sinclair Knight Mertz, uh, helped us develop that. It was actually pretty novel. And um, yeah, we had a big uh, telescope and we replaced that with smaller, more efficient telescopes. And we had to uh, get the lighter operator to crank the roof open and, um, and collect the data. But it was actually yeah, pretty successful, I think. Any final questions for Andrew? 
appreciation for your on oh, Andrew, just oh, um, quickly, please. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the the profile or the wind profile at the station and radio signs. The radio signs these days get their winds from GPS. So does does that data get used to correct the errors in the profiler, or is it how how do the two intertwine? Yeah. Interesting. So we use the radio songs to, to validate the profiler. Um, they're measuring different volumes, though. So the radio songs ascend and blow away, basically, downrange. So they can be you know, a few hundred kilometres away from the station. Um, and that's actually a, a useful thing in the, in the modelling for our radar, because we're at a fixed site. So we don't have to um, account for the difference in location of the measurements or the evolving location of the measurements. Well, we do use the, we have used the radio sons to, to validate the profiler. Um, and, um, but then those measurements are now, you know, validated and used in the, in the model. But they do sample slightly different volumes. The, the radio sun really is a point measurement. We're measuring a volume average over the site. There is one more question from, um... Warren online. Andrew, can you give again a roundup of physics instruments and sensors currently in use at the stations? <laughs> right. Well, I, I could do that very quickly. So I, I probably focused up on firstly the Bureau of Meteorology. So aside from their automatic weather stations, they operate the rheometers all stations. Geoscience Australia has at KC uh, a magnetometer and makes magnetic absolute measurements at Macquarie Island. Um, there's still a magnetometer there, uh, again, GA, and absolute measurements are made. At Davis Station, um, uh, there is really only one magnetic instrument that's run by um, uh, Kyushu University in Japan. Um, and at Mawson, there's a magnetic observatory. And then the Bureau operates um, uh, Ionosons at Casey and Mawson, like Macquarie Island at the moment, the antenna blew down. And then we're just focused in at, at Davis with our radars, LIDAR, um, and spectrometers. Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting. Uh, so, uh, do we still have a seismometer? Yes, at um, at Mawson, Casey, and Macquarie Island, there are seismic measurements, and that's part of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. But now also. There are other instruments, uh, radionuclide measurements at Macquarie Island and Mawson, and also infrasound at Davis. So they're all part of a network that uh, is um, used to uh, verify the nuclear test being treaty. Mm. Quite important. Jamie VK3ZTE says, regards summer, winter, etc., are they at the same time as Australia summer, winter, etc.? Yes, that's right. Yes. Um, uh, actually, uh, I guess, you know, from a radio um, standpoint, um, those cold temperatures in the upper atmosphere, we do see um, in summer over Australia, but not to the same extent as in the Antarctic. And, um, you know, I know that some radio amateurs at the moment are actually trying to, uh, to look at the mesospheric cloud uh, with different techniques, uh, radio propagation techniques to detect their latitudinal extent, which would be quite interesting to, to follow up on. But yes, and that region of low temperatures makes its way towards Australia and it varies from year to year. So it'd be interesting to probe that. Mm. 